This evening, the title of our show is The Unaccountable Congress. My guest is former congressman from Westchester, New York, Congressman Joseph Diaguati. Your book is published, and we want to get to the, the nuts and bolts of what this book is all about. Give us a little summary of what you're all about. Fine. Um, I spent uh, 22 years of my life uh, as a professional CPA uh, in the world's largest accounting firm, Arthur Anderson. And I was trained very well to uh, see the things that the public would like to hear about today when I spent uh, four years in Congress. I left at the age of 43 to, uh, to do something important with my life, and most people didn't think that someone who never ran before for any office and who came out of the accounting profession could uh, become a congressman. But it goes to show you uh, what my father said when he came here off that boat from Italy in 1929, that America works for those who work. And I worked very hard to uh, make my case to the people of Westchester County. I walked with my parents on both arms. I was very proud of what they did as immigrants. And I was elected in a very close race in a very tough district, a district carved in 1980 after the census then by a liberal Democrat. I'm characterized as a conservative Republican. I'm a fiscal conservative. So um, I served for that one term. And guess who came up to challenge me in 1986? The woman with the hat. Bella Rabzug. So she came up saying, well, the Aguati must be mismatched for this district. Let's see what we can do. That was another exciting race. She brought in many celebrities from Hollywood. Warren Beatty was sitting in front of the audience one time and Barbara Streisand. And one time I turned to her, I said, Bella, are we running in West Hollywood or West Chester? <laughs> because she moved up from Greenwich Village. Then um, there was another very tough close race in 88, which I just lost by 2,000 votes. That was when Bush lost New York State to Dukakis. And I decided to do something in the American tradition, something that Alexis de Tocqueville, the great Frenchman who came here in 1840, said in his book, Democracy in America, that America really works best in the neighborhoods, in the communities, when the citizens get involved. So I've now been a citizen activist for four years. I set up um, two civic leagues, a foundation, um, one set of civic leagues uh, and foundations on the issue of human rights, especially for the ethnic Albanians. My dad was born in Italy, but his blood was Albanian because 500 years ago, the uh, Ottoman Turks chased many Albanians into Italy, where they, thank God, uh, prospered until dad came here in 1929. They're still there, speaking Albanian and Italian. Uh, so today, that's very important because outside of Albania, which is now, thank God, a democratic country, and we just had the president of Albania here, the worst communist country in the world now has a democratic uh, regime. But outside of Albania, the motherland, there are three million Albanians in what used to be Yugoslavia. And it's falling apart right now as we speak. And I'm, speak I'm, I'm talking up for their human rights and self-determination. But the other foundation is called Truth in Government. And I've traveled around America in the past four years talking about the lack of fiscal responsibility in Washington, what I saw, and that's why it was important to write this book, Joe, because I wanted to leave uh, kind of uh, my account, my report to the public about how Washington has a double standard. They impose on the public through the Securities and Exchange Commission the toughest rules on accountability, but they exempt themselves, and that's not accountable. Fancy fiscal footwork hides real cost of government, and it's Joe Diaguati, the first practicing CPA ever elected to Congress is one of the real heroes in the war on waste. Joe reads the riot act over how our lawyer-filled Congress mismanages your money and cooks our national books using numbers like a drunk uses a lamppost for support rather than illumination. Well, Peter now, that's Grace a tells powerful <laughs> statement. And coming from a man like Peter Grace, Joe right. has been virtually alone when he was in Congress picking out the, the boondoggles. Joe, will you elaborate on some of the things you've seen in Congress? Well, you know, the, the thing that's, that's worst about what I see, or what I saw, and what I still see, because it hasn't changed. In fact, it's getting worse. We were supposed to have on the Graham Rudman no budget deficit by 1990. This year, they're projecting 350 billion. That's with a B. And that's keeping half of the savings and loan bailout off the books. Can you imagine putting something off the books? Well, Congress is doing that right now. When they count the budget, they decided to make a law that only half the cost of the bailout gets on the books. That's one of the outrageous things that I saw. 
that you can literally decide what's on the books and what's off the books. But the, the whole basis of our accounting and government is fraudulent. It's the cash basis of accounting. I call it the Mickey Mouse cash basis of accounting. It's the system we took New York City off of in 1975 as a price or a condition for the bailout. We still use it. Why is it bad? It's bad because politicians can use it to manipulate the bottom line. And obviously, every politician wants to look good every two years to get reelected. So they're not going to give you the biggest deficit. They're going to try to give you the least. So they use every gimmick to kind of pass as much on to the next generation as possible. That's why I put on the cover of the book a credit card, which I call the congressional credit card. It's really the congressman's voting card, which is a plastic card shaped just like a credit card. And as you can see on the book, it says credit line unlimited, expiration date never, and bill to future generations. And that's exactly what we're doing with this deficit spending, this national debt, which is now approaching $4 trillion with a T. We're passing it on to the next generation. But it's not just the bonded debt we're passing on. When you use the cash basis, you don't have to record the cost of guarantees. And you don't have to record a lot of these liabilities so that, in effect, the debt that we're passing on to the kids is a lot greater than the sum total of those bonds we're selling. Well, Joe, talking about the $4 trillion debt, uh, you know that uh, the debt has to be closer to $5.5 trillion because what they're doing is they're taking money out of the Social Security system and out of the, uh, the highway trust funds, and they're, re and they're replacing with IOUs. You're aware of that. Am I correct? Absolutely. In fact, I cover that in Chapter 5, and you know what the title of that is? Congressional Child Abuse, Send the Kids the Bill. Because what they literally did, did is they took the cash out of these so-called trust funds, which means they're not really trust funds. That's the way they're advertised. But they're not being truthful when they say that, because they took these surpluses out of the Social Security trust funds and the highway trust funds and a few others, and they literally used it to reduce the deficit, to make it look smaller. Now, that's not the way it should be. And Moynihan picked this up. Now, whether you're a Democrat or Republican, you've got to respect people who get on to good concepts. And Moynihan, a Democrat, saw this and said, wait a minute. We increased the Social Security taxes over 10 years because Carter put the base and the rate on automatic pilot. We reduced the income taxes, but the Social Security taxes, which are the most regressive kinds of taxes, because the first dollar of income is taxed. There are no exemptions, no deductions. So it hits the poor relative to the others even more. So here we have these greater Social Security taxes over 10 years. But what we did is we didn't leave them in the trust funds. We took them out and used them in the general fund, which means we used them like income taxes. But this Joe, is wrong. But Joe, if a corporation did that kind of bookkeeping, wouldn't all of the, uh, the executives of that corporation, wouldn't they be on a carpet or going to jail? They would be indicted under the Securities and Exchange Commission laws. It would be tantamount to securities fraud. And here's the largest issuer of securities in the world, the United States government. Why do I say that? Because every month they sell tens of billions of dollars of treasury notes, treasury bills, treasury bonds, but yet they don't give the public one piece of paper. And they use accounting principles and systems and gimmicks that if you use in a publicly traded corporation that issued stocks, you're right. The officers would be indicted and probably convicted and sent to jail. Well, then again, uh, this unaccountability that we see, where does the buck stop? Does it stop with the President of the United States? Does it stop with the House and Ways Means Committee? Where does it stop? What are we doing? Are we destroying the base that made this country? Well, you can see there's kind of a revolution going on right now. That's why uh, 77 members have already retired or have lost in primaries. And it's likely that this will be the largest freshman class maybe in history. We could have maybe 150 new members, which is incredible. But it's a sign of the discontent in the public. Look what happened here in New Jersey. I'm from New York, but I witnessed what happened when they changed the entire legislature over from one party to the other. Why? The public had enough with taxes. And by the way, they don't separate in their minds. My mother's 78. She lives up there in Westchester County. She still has the house we moved in when we moved from the Bronx in 1957. And you know, when she talks about taxes, she doesn't make a distinction between the federal taxes, the state taxes, the county taxes, the real estate taxes, the schools taxes, the sales taxes. Hey, it comes out of one pocket. That's right. And this, the, the, the misery index is very high in this area, the Northeast. Why do you think we're losing congressmen? I don't even know what my district is yet. You know why? We're losing three congressmen in the three seats in New York State, and the partisan fighting is to the point where they can't agree 
But look what's happening. Florida is gaining four. Texas is gaining one. California is gaining seven because they are not as oppressive when it comes to these taxes. So there is a point here, but the public is now speaking up. Well, and, 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 and these congressmen are getting the message. Just a couple of weeks ago, we had this scandal, this Rubbergate scandal, where 300, I believe it's 335 members of Congress, and I believe you're not one of them because they even look for past congressmen. And, and former members, but thank God right. I didn't bounce a check. I knew better to look at my checkbook before I wrote a check, but it goes to show you what's going on there. Joe, as you say, there's a revolution taking place, and the, the great American middle class is getting fed up, and they're showing it first at the polls. And if something doesn't change pretty soon, they're going to show it in other ways. I mean, the sleeping giant is starting to get irritated. Well, you make a very good point, because if so many members uh, have such little regard for looking at the balances in their accounts, and little regard for the behavior in the real life, which is where the citizens, they can't do that, you can imagine that this points to the behavior collectively that they have no regard for balancing the budget, because that's the collective checkbook of the United States. Every time they make votes that cost us, uh, cause us to go beyond the money we raise in taxes, you force the Treasury to sell bonds to cover that. In effect, you're writing checks beyond what the balance is. And look at this. The, def the budget deficits are going back into the three and four hundred billion dollar range. When in 1986, we were saying with Graham Rudman over four years, we would ratchet down the deficit 25% a year from 138 billion to zero by 1990. And they did away with that one. But Joe, more insidious than that. You know, you could, you could issue bonds and treasury notes, etc. But there's an interest on those notes. Nothing is done for nothing. Now, the, one of the biggest and expenditures... And you've got to pay the interest, otherwise you're in default. That's right. And one of the biggest expenditures in our budget right now is the interest on the debt. It goes over this year $200 billion. And none of that money, not one dollar, goes for jobs, for roads, social welfare, nothing good. And a good chunk of it goes to Germany, Japan, and well, uh, outside. Well, Joe, you said $200 billion. Uh, 200 billion. I've read... I've read accounts where it's closer to $390 billion when you really look at all of the debt that's been incurred and right, the but, interest. But, but what we actually have to pay out now is about $205 billion. What you're saying is that the Treasury notes that are put back in these other trust funds, they're accruing that interest. Well, they're it's, not it's, paying that interest right now. That's got to be paid out later. Where are they going to get the money? They're going to raise taxes in the next generation. But Joe, isn't that part of it, bookkeeping? If, I was doing, if I'm doing a job, I can't defray costs to another job. Right, but we don't have books like that. We have the Mickey Mouse cash basis of accounting. All they record now is what they spend in cash because there's no balance sheet. They don't put liabilities on the books. This is the thing. If they did, Joe, look at it. We have right now the issue for Social Security is not just the cash surpluses we took out. This is an obligation. We should measure today what the right to receive Social Security benefits are for the people alive today that will be retiring. That number is like three to four trillion dollars. So the national debt is double at least what you're talking about. Well, this is what I pointed out before because when you said four trillion dollars, I said it's more because we're dipping into all these other trust funds. And it's even more when you consider that the liability for Social Security is over three trillion dollars right now and a normal corporation would have to record all of its liabilities, but we don't do that. We just kind of pay as you go, and when we write the check, that's when we say the expense comes in. This is the biggest shell game in the world because the next generation has got to find that money. Okay, but there's something here that's happening. Look, with the, uh, with the progress that we've made in medical science, where we're extending the longevity of people, used to be at one time 39 years old was the average age. This is the turn of the century. 39 years old was the average age of, a, of an American. And in a lot of parts of the world today, it's still 39, where you don't have the, uh, the technology that we have today and the sanitary things and the means that we have in our country, thank God. But we've, ex we've expanded the life expectancy now to 78 for a woman and 74 for a man. Now, what happens is more people keep going into the Social Security. And, and less the birth rate is going down. You're more not, people are going to be retiring than working. More, right. At one time you had, at one time, I, I'm an economics major from Brooklyn College, and at one time you had 16 people serving one person on, on Social Security. They project by the year 2000 there will be six people serving one. How could that be? Well, because you're right, demographics, the graying of America, and that's why they're projecting by the year 2020, 
these surpluses, they're going to have to be paid back because more people will be taken out of the account than putting into the account. That's when the next generation is going to suffer some terrible burden because they're going to have to raise the taxes for the quality of life at that point, to create the jobs, to compete, but they're also now going to have to find the money to put back that we took. Where do we go to correct this? You know, it's easy to criticize. When you get back into Congress, and since you have the expertise in this, how are you going to try and affect this? First of all, we have to remember that the real power in America is not on Capitol Hill, and it's not on Wall Street, it's on Main Street. It's we, the people. The, the issue, though, is you've got to get the people involved. You've got to get them not only informed and educated, you've got to get them excited to do something about it. That is beginning to happen. That's why you see this Ross Perot phenomenon this year, because people are saying, hey, we don't want business as usual. Now, I wrote this book, and I put it in some pretty uh, stark uh, language, uh, in some cases outrageous language, good verbal images, because I wanted you to get mad enough to take this book into the voting booths with you and turn out those rascals from any party that are not using your tax dollars responsibly. So I would tell you that the real answer is to get to the public to make this case, to keep informing them. In Congress, obviously, I'm going to continue my crusade. I've always felt, Joe, that I was the Paul Revere of fiscal responsibility or irresponsibility. But, you know, back in 1985, 86, 87, 88, when I was there, not many people were listening when I was putting in bills to bring a chief financial officer to the United States of America. Thank God that bill was passed in 1990, and President Bush gave me credit for it. Now the people are listening to this issue. That's why I have to go back because this is an issue that I understand, I was professionally trained to see, and I don't wear blinders like the rest of the congressmen that I witnessed down there. I think I've got an open mind to see it and, and, to, and to tell the public what's going on. Well, you think were the, straight, talk straight. Well, Joe, you were the only CPA in 250 years. 15, yeah. Right? Absolutely. Oh, 215 years. The, the only, only CPA. Only practicing CPA. There were a couple of attorneys there that passed the CPA exam but they didn't uh, practice. Well, what about uh, Bill Graham? Was he a CPA, but he's in the Senate? No, he, he's not, but he's a good man, and you can see the frustration that uh, is, oh, no, he's still with us. It was Rudman, I think, that's saying Rudman, that he wants, to, one of them, yeah. Yeah, he wants to leave because he's frustrated, and he sees the way they took his bill, Graham Rudman, and they made it useless in 1990 with the Budget Enforcement Act. They didn't even advertise it. You didn't think they, they put RIP, rest in peace, on Graham Rudman? They just slipped it in, another bill called the Budget Enforcement Act. They made it obsolete, so now we're back to almost $400 billion in deficits. It's incredible. See, Congress can do anything it wants. It can pass a law one well, day and change it the next. Well, look, you know, you say the people could do what they want, but eventually somebody has to pay the piper. You can't you fool know. all the people all the time. That's right. Somebody's got to pay the piper. The bill has to come due. You could kite all you want eventually the kiting has to stop. But what is it going to come down on the heads of the American people? Why? Right. What was the reason? We were a viable nation, and I think we still could be a viable nation. No, and we still are, but the point is that if we keep on this track, we will ensure that we will remain the, the largest debtor nation in the world, and we could literally uh, become a second and third class nation if we continue while company, countries like Japan continue to produce continue to save and continue to plan the three things that we did well after World War II that we taught Japan, we forgot. That's and the real answer here is that we got to get government out of the way of people. We got to get this bureaucracy, and I know you laughed the last time on the show when I defined the bureaucracy. You want to hear it again? Say it again. The it bureaucracy was so is, is the process of turning energy into solid waste. <laughs> into crap. Right. <laughs> and, and this is what we got. I was there. I saw all these bureaucrats trying to make health care policy. There are no policies set by Congress. So the bureaucrats try to fill the vacuum. And it's not right. So if we continue on this path of putting government in the way of people, you will see that this nation will be reduced to one big welfare state. This is not what we want it to be. Private enterprise, free enterprise, individual freedom, initiatives, creativity, all these things have to blossom again. And how they do it, they got to pass tax laws that give incentives. They got to get these regulations out of the way. They got to come up with systems that encourage, you know, business to do the right things. Not what I'm seeing today, and we got to do this soon. There are roughly 573 federal programs to help the poor and the needy. And if you take that, if you took all the money that's allocated each year for the poor, you would have something like $60,000 for every man, woman, and child that is considered poor. Now, you and I know, Congressman, that 
they're not getting sixty thousand dollars. I mean, it's they're only not, not getting that. They're not even getting the housing they need. They put them in welfare motels in Westchester County. You've got many homeless people, you know, one-parent families in motels, and they can't cook in those motels. It's against the fire ordinances. The next morning, they got a bus or or. or get taxis uh, uh, for the kids to take them an hour or two to school. This is not the role model that this next generation needs. But let me say something. You mentioned the liberals. Because we got this knee-jerk liberalism in this country that is beginning to really undermine the traditional values, the, the great um, vision for what America was. You know, as soon as you hear the word uh, unwanted pregnancy, the first thing that the uh, knee-jerk response is abortion. Uh, if it's AIDS, uh, then you hear about uh, condoms. If it's uh, drugs, it's clean needles. Uh, if it's uh, homeless, it's a welfare motel. And if it's deficits, the key word is taxes. Why are we allowing America to be controlled by that kind of mindless liberalism that is going no place but creating a big government state that will reduce even the producers down to non-productive people? This is the challenge that America faces. Everybody, we have good people in America, poor, rich, but we need to get government out of their way, and government really belongs close to the people, in the neighborhoods, in the communities. When you put big government in Washington, it's less accountable, and that's why I wrote the book, Unaccountable Congress. You want to say something about your book? The well, first of all, I, I know it's in the bookstores out here because one day I went by Fort Lee when I was taping the McLaughlin show right across the street, and I saw it in the bookstore. So uh, anyone who wants the book, if it's not there, uh, the publisher is Regnery Gateway, uh, in Washington and just ask for Regnery's catalog and you could see it. It's written in a, in a very readable style like Reader's Digest uh, would write the book. You can do it chapter by chapter, nighttime reading. Don't read it all at once because it's too shocking to read all at once. Uh, but in any case, uh, uh, spread it around, uh, buy one and, and give it around the family so that everybody catches on and you'll see that nice quote from Peter Grace. There's one here from Bill Simon, former Secretary of the Treasury, and Jim Miller, the former OMB director, now the head of Citizens for a Sound. is good information. Go to the polls and forget this idea about Democrats and Republicans. Vote for people who are accountable. See what this book says, unaccountable Congress. I'm telling you, ladies and gentlemen, I become more enraged the more I go into this show because the facts that come out are disturbing. I mean, it's affecting my child's life and my grandchild's life that I don't even have yet. And all I want to tell you, my friends, is that it's up to you. You are the people that could do it. You have to affect the change, and you got only one power, the vote. Good night.